Right, so, so last lecture, um, I think Matt covered uh, two-phase locking. Um, and uh, two-phase locking is, is a mechanism that the database can use uh, to essentially generate uh, serializable schedules uh, at runtime. Um, and it relies on locks to be able to do that. Today we're going to be talking about a, a collection of protocols that don't rely on locks, but instead rely on, on timestamps. Um, at a high level, maybe with, uh, a good way to think about this is that um, two-phase locking um, assumes that there's going to be a lot of contention inside of the, inside of the transactions that are executing inside, in, in, in the database. Right? So if there's a lot of contention, then it's obviously advantageous to um, be defensive and take a lot of locks. So anytime you want to read or write into, um, into a database object, you acquire these locks. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's quite pessimistic. On the other hand, you can view uh, timestamp ordering based techniques as more optimistic, right? Um, you allow the database to operate uh, and read and write data without actually acquiring locks. And at the end of the day, you sort of rec you're able to correctly reconcile um, the, the a correct serializable schedule at the end of the day. And we'll talk about how this is actually done inside, inside of the database. Um, there's actually going to be two timestamp ordering protocols we're going to talk about in this lecture. One of them is actually called timestamp ordering or basic timestamp ordering. And another one is going to be called um, the optimistic concurrency control. It's a, little, it's a little bit confusing because they're both optimistic and they're both timestamp ordering. This is just the, the nomenclature that the community has come up with. Um, all right, so let's get started. The basic idea for these timestamp-based protocols um, is that it's a mechanism that the database can use to assign uh, numeric values to timestamps that predefine the, the, the commit order of these transactions. You can assume that there's going to be a new function here called TS that given a transaction um, gives you the timestamp for that transaction. And so what the database tries to guarantee is that if a transaction TI has a timestamp that's less than the transaction TJ, then in the serial schedule, it's as if TI had occurred before TJ inside of the database, okay? So um, how is this done? Like, what do these timestamps look like? The timestamps are sort of unique fixed numeric values, and they have a couple of interesting characteristics that, that's characteristics that the database has to maintain. The first one is that these timestamps have to be monotonically increasing, okay? So they have to always go forward in time and increase in time. The second thing is that they have to be um, unique values, right? So you can never have two transactions have the same timestamp because of this monotonically increasing characteristic. So, so again, assume that the, the database now has this new function, this TS function, that's able to take uh, a transaction ID and return to you the timestamp for that transaction. And um, these, uh, 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 these different timestamp protocols have different mechanisms by which, uh, and, and time points at which they actually assign these timestamps to the transactions. An important characteristic is that these timestamps don't necessarily have to correspond to the wall clock time. Um, because it could be assigned to the transaction at any point during its, its, its execution, not necessarily when it enters the system, not even necessarily when it's about to commit, right? So different protocols have different mechanisms by which and time points at which they actually assign timestamps to transactions. Um, there's, a, there's a few different ways on how you actually source a timestamp for a transaction, okay? And, I've listed, and there's a few listed here. The simplest thing you could do is just ask the CPU, uh, okay, what is the current time, right? Because time is always increasing. You could assume that this kind of makes sense. Right, but there's a there's a few drawbacks. Can anybody think about a few drawbacks for using wall clock time or, or real time as a, as a timestamp? Yeah. Uh, you are not sure that the computer's time is actually correct. So that doesn't really matter as long as you're going to the same computer and as long as the time the time is monotonically increasing, yeah, then you should be okay. What if I have distributed right. So that's a good point. Right. So if you have distributed uh, a distributed database, then it's difficult to keep these time points in sync. What's another problem with using wall clock time? It's not monotonically increasing. You can turn back the clock. You can turn back the clock. When would you actually turn back the clock? Maybe because of NTP time synchronization and your computer is running faster than it. So the sure. Yeah, so there could be some skew in the actual granularity which you tra track time. Is there another, an another possible drawback? Yeah. Um, you have to keep all of the timestamp rather than just like saying like an event one is an event one, an event two, and event three. You don't really need to keep track of how long it is between each of those events. Keeping track of that data, you might not necessarily need. So you don't actually have to keep duration of time. You just need like one point. Like this is time point one, time point two, and it's increasing. So it's not necessarily by duration. It's just about a point in time. Okay. So a clue is that it's going to happen this weekend. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so daylight, sa day daylight, daylight savings, right? So it could be the case that you know you're operating on on the weekend, and then at random at a, at a random point, your clock back goes back an hour, and your your time stamps are pretty much screwed. Okay. Um, another option is actually to use these logical counters, right? So you can think of having just a, regist a register in the CPU dedicated to having a monoton monotonically increasing 32-bit, 64-bit value. Are there any drawbacks or potential downfalls for this approach? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the distribution aspect is still an important factor. Um, but assume that there's one counter for the CPU and it's really fast to increment it without requiring locks. Like you can do an, an atomic addition or something like that. Are there any problems with using this logical counter? So I said specifically 32 bits or 64 bits. What happens if you run out of 32 bit values? Then you saturate your addition and you roll back, right? So your counter is now going backwards in time. So that's one of the problems with this approach. Um, so most systems actually use this hybrid approach, which is like a physio physiological thing. It, it, it sort of matches both the physical counter and a logical counter to make sure that uh, everything sort of works out. So the system clock, um, one problem is you have daylight savings times, right? So at a point in time when daylight, sa daylight savings occurs, your time, your time move backs or f moves back an hour. So now your time is not monotonically increasing, it's not going back in time. Okay? Right, so just to um, give you an idea of what the agenda is gonna be today. So we're gonna talk about something called the basic timestamp ordering protocol. Then we're gonna talk about Optimistic concurrency protocol, which is also a timestamp based protocol. And then we're going to talk about a partition based timestamp ordering protocol, which alleviates some of the, the bottlenecks that regular timestamp ordering protocols have. And then we're going to talk about isolation levels. Okay? So let's get started. So, with these timestamp ordering schemes, the general idea is that you want the transactions to proceed in the system reading and writing objects without actually acquiring locks. Okay, to make this possible, you now have to, you have to add some extra metadata to all of the database objects to make this possible. Specifically, you have to add two extra timestamps to every single tuple in the, in the system. You have to add a read timestamp, which represents the timestamp of the transaction, the most recent transaction that read this item, and a write timestamp, which is the timestamp of the most recent transaction that wrote into this, uh, this tuple in, in the system. And then, as a transaction is, is, is going through its operations, it's going to make sure that it can actually read this tuple by leveraging the timestamps that are associated with this tuple. Okay, and I'll, and I'll talk about how this is done. So for reads, <clears throat> there's an invariant that you have to make sure before you, you're actually allowed to read a value from the database system. You have to ensure that the timestamp, so you read your own timestamp for this transaction TI, you have to make sure that it's less than the right timestamp for this tuple in the system, okay? Does that make sense? What does that mean? That, mean, that means that's essentially making sure that um, there's no other transaction that's written into the system. Uh, yeah, there's no other transaction in the system that's wrote into, the, into this tuple that should have read your, um, that, that, who's, who's, you're not reading a, a value of the tuple from the future, right? So there's, there's a transac transaction in the future that's overwritten the database value um, that you should now be reading. That's essentially, that, that, that's a problem. And when this happens, you essentially have to abort. And when you abort, you have to make sure that you start with a newer transaction, a, a newer timestamp um, than the one that you had when you initially began the transaction. Does everybody sort of understand why you need to assign a newer timestamp? What would happen if you had the same timestamp you had before? Exactly, you run into the same problem, right? You have, so that's because, because you have to ensure timestamps are monotonically increasing, you have to get a new timestamp to avoid this problem. Yeah? Do you ever run into an issue if it was your timestamp that was last, like you double try to double write to the same address and the same timestamp as your current timestamp also? So if your timestamp is the same as a write timestamp, what does that mean? Well, that means that you wrote it. Exactly. So you can read it. You can read it, right? That should be repeatable reads. That's perfectly fine. Yeah? So when we talk about the uh, time of the transaction, is it when you start the contract? Does it matter? So in this scheme, uh, the timestamps are assigned uh, when you begin the, begin the transaction. Okay. 
So if this invariant is invalidated, you essentially have to abort. But on the other hand, um, if you're allow actually allowed to perform the read, then you, uh, you modify the read timestamp for, for this tuple to take the maximum of whatever the read timestamp is right now and what your own timestamp is. Does anybody know why you have to take the maximum? Okay, timestamps have to be monotonically increasing, right? You could have a transaction that's newer than you, update the read timestamp, but you can't set back the timestamp back to what you were because you're older, right? Timestamps have to be monotonically increasing. So you have to take the maximum of whatever it is right at this point in time when you read it and what your own timestamp is. So this is important, okay? So once you've updated the, the timestamp, um, you now have to make a copy of this tuple into some local private workspace that's only uh, visible to you so that you can ensure that you get repeatable reads. Yeah? Um, why, why do we need to abort PI and restart with the newer timestamp? Um, if you violate the timestamp ordering, doesn't it mean that uh, your current script is doing something like uh, so there's a assume that there's some there's some tuple that you want to read right and the right timestamp is from a transaction that's newer than you that's in the future right you shouldn't be able to read that value right you should be reading the value that existed before it wrote before the new transaction wrote it so that's why it it invalidates. If you abort and restart, then you are essentially reading that value in the future. You, yeah, yeah, because you now appear in a different order in the serial order, right? You should, you, because your timestamp is newer than the one that wrote to it before, you logically appear after this transaction in the serial order. Why yeah. Have, Go ahead. Why do you have to make a local copy of it? So this is not, I don't think it's covered in, in, in the book, but you have to make sure that uh, you have to make a local copy so that you can issue repeatable reads. Why? Can you why? So you can imagine that a tra another transaction comes in and updates the system, um, <coughs> but you have to be able to read the same value that you read initially, right? But if you, do, but if the, if you allow another transaction to update the value here, then you would invalidate this, this, this invariant up top and you wouldn't be able to read it, but you actually should be able to read it, right? Because you wrote it, you read it, uh, in a transactionally consistent state. Yep. So if you have uh, multiple transactions that are trying to access maybe like similar objects, maybe the same objects, and you're going to have the problem where uh, you, you restart it every time, but then you run into the same problem. Right? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. I think you're alluding to the fact that there could be starvation where you have consistently consistent aborts. That's a that's a drawback of this approach, and we'll get sort of get to that later in in, in the presentation. Okay. So this is just for reads. You have a similar, similar story for writes. Okay, so if your transaction, if, you, if your timestamp is less than the, the read timestamp of the, of the object that you're trying to write into, that means there's a newer transaction um, that read a stale value, a value that, you, that should have been coming from you as a transaction, but as in, is not anymore. So that's a violation of, the, of this timestamp ordering protocol. Similarly, if you have a, if your timestamp is less than the right timestamp of another of a of, of the of the object, then again, there's a newer transaction that essentially overrode your value, and again, that's a violation. And the idea is that if either of these conditions are true, you have to abort and again start with a newer timestamp value and begin the entire process again. If, on the other hand, um, these this is a it's a valid right, then you have to update the right timestamp for the tuple. And, and you're essentially you're essentially done. You have to also make a, co a local copy here, because in order to support repeatable reads, um, you you read your local copy instead of going back to the in, uh, into the database's global state. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so let's walk through an example. Hopefully, this will uh, clear things up a little bit. So um, we have two transactions here, and just assume that you can only execute one transaction, one operation at a time. So you can assume single core, single thread. And uh, in this database, we now have annotated all of the, the tuples we have, um, in all of the objects here with a read timestamp and a write timestamp. Okay, so let's get started. So we have uh, T1 and T2. When uh, they enter the system, 
they're assigned a timestamp. Assume that T1 is, is assigned a timestamp of 1 and T2 is assigned a timestamp of 2, right? Pretty simple. Then you do the read. Uh, so T1 does uh, a read of B. You look at the write timestamp for B. It's 0. 1 is greater than 0. So you update the read timestamp to 1. Then we do a context switch into transaction 2. And T2 now wants to do a read of B. You look at the write timestamp. Um, and you're good to go. So you update the read timestamp to take the maximum of what it was, which is 1, and the new timestamp, 2, and you get 2. All right? Now you do um, a write. So T2 wants to do a write of B. You look at the write timestamp and the read timestamp. You're greater than both. So you update the write timestamp of B to 2. Okay? Now you do a context switch back into T1. T1 wants to do a read of A. It looks at the, the write timestamp of, of A, um, 1 is greater than 0, so you update the read timestamp to be the maximum of 0, 1, and you're good to go. Sorry, yeah, you update the read timestamp to 1. Now you come back over to transaction 2, and uh, 2 wants to do a read of A. You look at the write timestamp of A, 2 is greater than 0, you update the read, time, <laughs> read timestamp to 2 now. And then finally, um, T2 wants to do a read of A, so it looks at both the read timestamp and the write timestamp of A. It's greater than both of them, so the, so the write is valid. And um, uh, yeah, so no validations exist. Uh, um, no, no, no violations exist. So both transactions are safe, and you can commit both of them. All right, this is, is this clear? OK, good. So let's walk through um, another example. So it's the same setup here. Um, all, the trans all the initial timestamps are 0. Uh, T1 and T2 enter the system. T1 gets, transact gets uh, timestamp 1, T2 gets timestamp 2, all right? So in this scenario, uh, T1 wants to do a read. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good read, so it, up it updates the, the read timestamp, do a context switch, um, and now T2 wants to do a write of A. It checks the write timestamp and the read timestamp. It's valid, so it updates the write timestamp to 2. T1 now is trying to do a write of A. So it checks the write timestamp and the read timestamp, it's no longer valid because you have the, the timestamp of 1, which is 1, is less than the right timestamp of A, which is 2. This is a violation. So T1 actually can't commit. It has to abort. Is that clear? You can think about this as like in the serial order, because T1 has timestamp 1 and T2 has timestamp 2, T1 should appear before T1 in the serial order. Um, so this is uh, obviously going to be uh, a violation because this read here is going to be aborted. Okay. Um, sorry. So there's actually um, an optimization that we can make here to avoid aborting in this specific scenario, right? You can think about it as um, in physical time, what's happening, right? T2 is writing to something, but then it's being overwritten by T1. So do we really need this write? I think the observation is yeah, you actually don't need it. Um, what you could have is, because we've maintaining a local, every transaction is maintaining a local copy of the, sup of the tuples, this right here can, can essentially be ignored by the system, right? Because externally, um, this right is what's valid. And as long as this right is externally valid, then you don't actually need this one externally. Within the transaction, you still need this right because you have to be able to read your own rights. So, this, this observation um, leads to an optimization that you, you can apply in these timestamp-based systems called the Thomas Wright rule. And the idea is that if you're trying to write into an object x, um, as before, if your timestamp is less than the, the read timestamp for that object, you still have to abort and start with a newer, a newer, a newer timestamp. But um, if the timestamp is less than the write timestamp of the object, which means there's a newer transaction that wrote into this object, you can actually just ignore ignore the write altogether. You have a local copy of the write that you can now read, but externally it's okay to ignore this write. We have to update the local copy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So this write is only important to T1, right? So it's not, it doesn't really, I don't actually have to propagate it back to the database because it's going to be overwritten by this write. Because in the serial order, this happens first, and then this, hap oh, this happens. Okay. Okay, because this has a transaction, a, t a timestamp of 1, this has a timestamp of 2. 
right? Yeah, so this optimization, and it's actually quite useful um, in this specific, this specific scenario, um, it allows you to have the, uh, actually, actually commit this, um, this, this, this schedule. So this is um, uh, the same example as before. T1 begins, write reads A, updates the read timestamp. Uh, T2 begins, does a write. Now we recognize that this write should normally be invalid. Uh, we actually, but in, by applying the Thomas write rule, we don't actually update the write timestamp or the value A, but we just maintain this local copy, we ignore it, and we allow T1 to continue. All subsequent reads for this read, all subsequent reads of A in, times, in transaction one occur in the local copy um, with this value. Okay. For all subsequent reads, we won't now check the condition of them, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's essentially basic timestamp ordering. Um, like two-phase locking, is a, it's a mechanism for the database to generate conflict serializable schedules um, as long as you don't apply this, this, this Thomas Wright rule, okay? Um, it, does, it can prevent uh, deadlocks altogether because as you're um, similar to how two-phase locking works, at, for every operation you're performing on the database, you're making sure that this is, a, this is a valid operation. It's sort of like deadlock prevention, right? You're incrementally generating the serialization graph, and as soon as you detect, detect a cycle, you invalidate it, you abort it in, in two-phase locking. Here, you're incrementally checking for every operation whether it's valid or not based on these timestamps, and then aborting eagerly, as eager as possible. Okay? Um, one drawback here, which I think one of the students led to, is um, you could have a you have the possibility of starvation, right? You have you can think of a, a long transaction that's been running for a long time, and then you have these uh, short transactions that are performing that exist for a very short period of time, update a few tuples, and then commit and leave. These are essentially going to invalidate all of the old transactions, causing conflicts, causing uh, cyclical aborts. Okay, so. Um, so another thing that we should talk about here is uh, um, these, these time step ordering protocols, uh, they, 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 they allow, they permit schedules that are not recoverable, okay? So what is a recoverable schedule? So a schedule is recoverable if um, a transaction only commits if all the previous transactions that it relied on data for, from also have committed. You can think of this as like, the, like, like a cascading, cascading abort, right? Um, you want to make sure that if you read a value from it that's updated by another transaction, that that transaction commits before you commit. Basic timestamp ordering does not guarantee this for you. Okay, so I want to talk about um, how this, this specific uh, recover, this specific characteristic is violated by, by basic timestamp ordering. So imagine we have the same setup here. Um, we have two transactions, T1 and T2. T1 has timestamp 1, T2 has timestamp 2. So T1 does... Um, a write of A, T2 does a, a read of A, and then a write of B. So in this serial order, T1 occurs first and T2 occurs second. So this read can now read this write, and that's okay. It does some write of B, which is okay, and commits, right? So T2 has committed at this point. But let's say later on in the, in the system, this transaction has aborted. The problem is that we've now notified the client, we've notified externally to the world that this transaction is committed. But it read a value from a transaction that aborted. Right? So this is actually invalid. Now it's, not a, it's not a recoverable schedule because when the system comes back, um, you know, we have to recognize that this is aborted and that we should not apply these rights. Okay? So this is not a recoverable schedule, but it is permitted by the basic timestamp order and concurrency protocol. Right? Yeah, so, so T1 aborts after T2 is committed, and this, um, this violates the recoverable schedule requirement. Okay, so um, I think a lot of people have sort of picked up on this, but this, this, uh, um, these basic timestamp ordering, the, the protocol has a lot of overhead, right? So every time you do um, a write or a read, you need to now copy it into your, your local workspace. So if you're updating or reading and writing billions of tuples, you have to make billions and billions of copies per transaction in a local memory space, right? And that's obviously a lot of overhead. Um, another thing that, again, was picked up by uh, one of the students is that 
you could have starvation by, from long, from long running transactions uh, by short running transactions that quickly update one or two tuples and then um, require the long, running, the long running transaction to abort and restart. Um, so, so what can we do? Um, if you think about it, right, so two-phase locking and this basic timestamp ordering protocol that I just talked about, they're also somewhat pessimistic, right? So in two-phase locking, as soon as you read and write a value from the database, you have to acquire some lock to protect yourself from other transactions in the system. With basic timestamp ordering, you're kind of doing the same thing, right? Every time you want to read and write a tuple, you have to make sure that the timestamps align just right so that you can perform the operation that you want to perform, right? So they're both assuming that there's a lot of contention in the system and try to prevent this, uh, from, from, from prevent something wrong from happening. But what if you make a different assumption? What if you assume that there's not going to be a lot of contention in the system? What different types of optimizations can you apply assuming that, there, um, that transactions are essentially very short-lived and are essentially conflict-free, right? Can you be even more optimistic than the stuff that we've talked about so far? And we'll talk about one example, one concurrency protocol that makes this assumption and applies a lot of different types of optimizations. Okay. And it's called, as the name suggests, optimistic concurrency control. So it takes a very optimistic view of how, of how the transactions run in, in the system. So OCC, um, optimistic concurrency control, uh, was, was written um, here at CMU by H.D. Kung. This, uh, he's no longer a professor here, I think he's at at Harvard, but it's pretty cool that one of the you know premier concurrency control protocols was actually written here at CMU. Okay, um, whoops. The 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 idea is as in the basic timestamp timestamp ordering protocol, every operation you perform, what you do is you first make a uh, you first make a local copy of that data into a local thread local private workspace. Okay, anytime you want to read a copy, anytime you want to read an element from the database, you First make a copy from it, and then you're good to go. If you want to make an update to it, you first make a copy of it into your local workspace, and then you apply the update to your local copy. Okay, you don't perform an in-place update anymore. All right. Then, um, once all of this work is done, uh, the, the, and you're ready to commit, you have to essentially make sure, you have to validate that all the changes you make are transactionally consistent with the rest of the transactions that are running in the system concurrently with you. Okay, and I'll talk about how this is done specifically in the workspace uh, in, in, in the following slides, sorry. Um, so after this validation step, after the database has, valid, has ensured yeah, that, hey, listen, your transaction is good to go, we have to now install all the changes that are in your private workspace into the global database system. And we have to do this atomically. Okay, and again, I'll talk about how this is done um, in the system. Uh, okay, so... The, the, the way that OCC works is that it's split up into three phases. The, the first phase is called the read phase. Um, then you have the validation phase, which is essentially going to validate that this transaction is actually still valid and doesn't conflict with anything else. And once the validation phase is done, then you actually have to install your changes from your private workspace into the global database. All right? So the read phase is, is a bit of a misnomer, right? You're actually allowed to do both reading and writing in it. So I didn't want to make sure that that gets across. I actually don't even like the, the phrase read phase. I actually prefer work phase, where you're de doing the actual work for the transaction. Okay, so in the work phase, um, you're making your reads and writes, you're updating values, you're reading values, all in a private workspace. In the validation phase, when the, tra the transaction is ready to commit, the database does a bunch of uh, you know, sanity checks to make sure that this, tr this is a valid transaction. And then in the right phase, you atomically install all your changes into the, into the global database. Okay, so let's just quickly walk through an example of how this is going to work. Um, okay, so the first thing is that we have the same database we had before, but we've removed the, right time, the read timestamp now. We just have a write timestamp. The second thing is that we've now demarcated the boundaries for all the phases. We've, we've really just done this for illustration. The, data, the transaction is not going to specifically say, hey, I want to start my read phase, I'm going to start my validate phase, and then the commit phase. This is, it's going to be done, it's going to be handled for you uh, by the database system itself, much like how the two-phase locking protocol is implemented for you by the database, not by the transaction. Right? The transaction is just doing a bunch of reads and writes. Okay, so um, another thing that I want to point out is that um, unlike basic timestamp ordering, the transaction, the timestamps aren't necessarily assigned when the transaction enters the system. 
Okay, they're, they're actually deferred to a later point in time, and we'll get into, into how that's done. Um, okay, so we're ready to, to, to get started. Uh, we begin transaction T1. It now wants to do a read of A. Um, so it constructs a private workspace that is essentially somewhat of a copy of the database. Upon read, it's going to read or make a copy of A into its private workspace, along with the, the write timestamp for whatever it read from the database system. Now T2 begins, and it begins its read phase. When it begins the read phase, it has to construct this private workspace for, for transaction T2. Um, it does a read of A into its private workspace along with the, the, the write timestamp, um, and then we're good to go. So now we get to the, to, the, to the validation phase. So this is essentially T2 saying to the database, hey, listen, I'm ready to commit. What it does is the, data, the database will now enter the validation phase for T2. Um, it's at this point that the, that the timestamp is assigned to the, to, to the transaction, okay? So, so far, this transaction doesn't yet have a timestamp. You can assume that its timestamp is infinity. Here, when, it enter <coughs> when T2 enters the validation phase, it gets a timestamp of one, right? So what does it do? Um, it, it now, uh, it, it doesn't have to do any, any sort of validation because there's none, um, nothing to really validate. It's a read-only transaction. Um, so it begins to write. It, it falls into the write phase. There's nothing to write. And then it commits and everything is sort of done. Okay? That's a pretty simple example. <clears throat> now we do a context switch back into T1. T1 now wants to do a write. So it makes a modification to its local copy and it assigns a timestamp of infinity. Okay, why does a timestamp have to be infinity? Does this transaction have a timestamp yet? It doesn't have a timestamp, right? Because it hasn't entered validation. You only get a timestamp when you enter validation. So if it doesn't have a timestamp, then it doesn't know what its timestamp is going to be, so it assumes infinity, right? And it'll fill this in when it begins the validation phase, which is here. So it now begins the validation phase. It gets a timestamp assigned to it, too. <clears throat> and then when uh, there's no other concurrent transactions running in the system, so the validation phase completes. And it now has to write its local copy, all of its local changes, into the global database space. When it does this copy, um, it has to update the write timestamp for this tuple A to the, to the timestamp that it was assigned when it began validation. So two. So it writes the write timestamp of two here. OK? This is a pretty simple example. It's like a happy path example of how transactions work. OK, so um, the work phase is sort of simple, right? Anytime you want to read and write a value, you make a copy of it into your local workspace, and then you modify the local workspace alone. Once you're done the work phase, you now begin the validation phase. Um, the validation phase is where the database ensures that the, that the schedule that it can generate is serializable, right? It's conflict serializable. <clears throat> the way that it does this is that for every transaction, um, it has to make sure that the, the read-write set, right? So the set of things that it has modified doesn't conflict, doesn't have a read-write conflict or a write-write conflict with all other concurrent transactions in the system, right? And there's a mechanism for how, how to do this. Um, there's actually a couple of different mechanisms. Um, well, these slides are a little bit out of order. Um, and the way that you, so the way that the database can ensure that these transactions don't, or like the, the sets are, you know, properly serializable, um, is that it needs to have a global view of all active transactions running in the system. If you have a global view of all transactions running in the system, you now have a global view of all of the, the modifications every transaction has made in the system. Okay, and then you, you use these read-write sets um, as a mechanism to determine the ordering of the transactions in the, in the system. Um, so, um, I, think, uh, I think one of the things that um, we, we want to try to get across here to simplify the, the, the entire protocol is that the, this validation and writing happens serially, serially. So the entire system, you can think about it as um, there's a giant latch over the, the, the validation phase, quote unquote, well, the validation phase to ensure that there's only one transaction performing validation at a time. And this will simplify some of the protocols. We're going to this simplify some of the details we're talking about in the, in the protocol a little bit later on. Um, so, yes, yeah, so in the read phase, as, as I mentioned before, um, whenever you're trying to read and write a uh, value, you make a local copy, um, and you only update that local copy. 
uh, to ensure repeatable reads. And then in the validation phase uh, is when you get is is when you get a timestamp, and then you use this timestamp to look at all other concurrent transactions in the system to make sure that you uh, don't uh, you don't intersect like your read and write sets don't inter intersect to make sure that you have a correct serial order. Um, so you look at your you look at your timestamp for, for for TI. You find all other time, uh, transactions in the system that are younger than you, that are newer than you, and you have to make sure that a set of conditions holds. I mean, the fact that we're using newer transactions isn't necessarily required. You could also look at older transactions, right? There's no reason why we're specifically looking at younger transactions, but it simplifies, it, it makes things a little bit simpler. And I'll talk about another approach that we can use that's slightly different than this one. So when, you, when you're ready to validate, you essentially invoke the commit, and then the, the database performs a validation phase. So it finds, because it has a global view of all the transactions in the system, it can find all newer transactions and all older transactions and make sure that everything sort of is, uh, fits together. And there's two types of validations that you can perform. You can perform forward validation or, ba or backwards validation, right? So what, are the, what is the difference between these two types of validation techniques? Um, so in, in, um, in, in, in backwards validation, what you're looking at is when a transaction is ready to commit, Let's assume that transaction T2 is ready to commit. You look at all the older transactions in the system. Okay, so T2 is ready to commit. Its commit point is here. Um, and you're doing backwards validation. You have to find all older transactions. So trans trans transactions whose timestamps are less than this one and perform a validation, right? So we call this the, the scope of things that we have to look at a validation scope. So this is the validation scope for T2 if we're doing backwards validation because T1 and T2 are running concurrently and T1 committed before T2. So T1 is older than T2, all right? Because it could be the case that T1 made an update to something that should have been read by T2, but we didn't because T1's changes are made to a private copy, all right? So it could be the case that we read something that, from the database system that we should have been reading, reading from T1, but we actually read from the main database because the T1 is making private changes to its own space. So we have to make sure that this, this, uh, this doesn't happen. And if it does, we have to actually abort T1. So this is backwards validation. We're looking backwards. <coughs> mm -hmm. So if there's a conflict, we abort T2? Correct, yeah, because this is already committed, right? At this point, we can't do anything about T1, okay? Similarly, instead of going backwards, you could also look forwards. So again, we're trying to do the, the validation for T2. Um, we find all concurrently running transactions that have not committed yet, and we do a validation against those. So in this specific scenario, um, T3 is concurrently running, and we have to make sure that this is transactionally safe, because it could be the case that I made an update, so T2 made an update into its local private space, but because it occurs before T3 in the serial order, this one has read a stale value from the database. It should have read something that I modified, like maybe I modified it here and it hasn't read it here, um, but it actually read a stale value. And if that happens, I, I have to abort myself. Okay, so these are just two techniques, two, two mechanisms in which we perform the validation. What's really important here is that, they all, that, the entire, that all transactions perform this validation in the same direction. You can't have T1 performing forward validation and T2 performing backwards validation because that's going to mess up the entire system. Yeah. So, like, uh, if you're doing forward validation and uh, T2 completed its validation stage, right? But what happened was after that, somehow, like, something happened and it aborted. So now nothing can abort T3, but T3 has read something that T2 has written. So now somebody needs to abort T3 also, right? So if the validation completes, then you're essentially committed. You're ready to write your changes out. But like, just when you completed validation, something happened and like, you abort it. Like, something can happen in the database, right? You mean like the system goes down? Like, uh, so you're saying after validation completes, nothing can happen that can make T2 work? No, yeah, because the validation, if validation is, is successful, that the database is saying that this is a valid transaction. It doesn't, it doesn't conflict with anything else. So it's, it should now be installed into, into, into the system. All right. 
So, okay, so for the rest of this lecture, let's just assume that we're always doing forward validation. So anytime you want to validate a transaction, you find all newer transactions than you, and you perform the va this validation step. Okay, so there's a couple of different um, scenarios that we have to cover. Okay, the first scenario is that if you find a transaction TJ, um, where all your phases, your read, your, your, sorry, your work, your, va your validation, and your write steps happen before anything that TJ has done. Right, this is sort of like the simple happy path case. So, here, so this is an, an example. You have T1 and T2. T1 completes all of its steps before T2 has done anything. Okay, so this is a really simple example. You could essentially collapse this into one and now you have a serial execution. So you don't really have to do anything all that interesting here. This is sort of given to you uh, naturally. The second, um, the, the second scenario that we have to uh, uh, handle is that if T1 completes before TJ, sorry, TI completes before TJ begins its write phase, okay? And we have to make sure in this scenario that the stuff that we write, the, the, the write set in our transaction doesn't interact, intersect with the read set of the other transaction. So the other transaction hasn't read anything that, we're gonna, that, we're, that we've written. Okay, why is this important? So let's walk through an example. So, um, in this scenario, we have two transactions. T1 is reading and writing A. T2 is reading A and doing nothing else. So, um, so this is the state of the database. So T1 has read A and written to it. Assume that it's writing the same value, 1, 2, 3, and its timestamp is infinity. T2 has read A, so it has a timestamp of 0 there, and it has a local copy in its, in its private workspace. And then you want to perform the, the validation here, right? So T1 has to abort because its read set, so it has a, it has a lower timestamp than, than T2 because it begins validation first. So its write set intersects with the read set here. Right? So that, that violates the invariant that we had before, so we have to um, abort this transaction. Okay? In the serial order, T1 has to begin before T2, but T2 has read a stale value, so we have to abort. That, that's, that's a, I think it's a pretty simple example. Um, but now let's, let's slightly tweak it, and now we'll have T2 begin validation before T1. So in the serial order, T2 happens before T1. What's going to happen in this, in this case, right? So T1 um, reads A, begins validation. It doesn't have a write set, so it doesn't, doesn't have anything to intersect with this transaction, so it, so it commits. T2 does the same thing. Um, uh, um, it's, it's write set uh, doesn't inter uh, intersect with the, the, the read set of t. It um, doesn't intersect with any other concurrent transaction because it's this one's already validated. So another thing, like nothing happens, right? So in the serial order, t two happens before t one. It reads the value of a that initially existed before. This transaction is going to read the value of a there. Make a local copy, write to it and everything's okay. All right? Questions? Yes? Uh, in this case as well, the, the transaction to not read a stale value? So in this, in this scenario, because T2 begins validation first, it appears first in the serial order. Yeah. Yeah. So T. So T one has to abort because in the serial order, what should have happened is that T two because it begins validation first. It's the first to recognize that there's something wrong. So. It recognizes something's wrong as soon as it begins the validation because it gets assigned a timestamp. Yeah. It sees a concurrent transaction that's read a stale value, so it aborts. Well, when T2 goes to validate, T1 no, is no longer a valid transaction, so it won't see any concurrent transactions. There's nothing to intersect with. Also, it's a read-only transaction, so there's nothing to intersect with. Oh, oh, maybe because T2 couldn't 
read the value that T1 is right, right? T2 couldn't? Couldn't read the value from T1. Right? No, not until it stalls its, its changes, because it's a private, a private thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, question. So, like, in this case, like, won't, uh, in the first example it says, like, won't the right hand step of T1 get updated to 1, and that it will, from that it will understand that uh, T2's validate phase has not started. Like, it can't compare from infinity, right? When it starts the validation phase, then it gets a new time step, and then only it can get to go, right? Yeah, so when, when this T1 get, begins its right, uh, Phase. Begins the validate phase. Right uh, it'll get a timestamp. Yeah, it'll get I don't know one or two or something. But this T two doesn't have a, a right timestamp yet. Because it is zero, right? Yeah, I mean it's infinity. It we, it doesn't have any timestamp because it hasn't begun validation yet. No, no, no. So it will be infinity when it writes. No, 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 no. So the 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 trans the timestamp is assigned to the transaction. It doesn't assume that it doesn't take whatever timestamp is from the the tuple. Yeah, so that's just a local copy. Yeah, I'm talking about the local copy. Okay, yeah. The local copy will have zeros, and it will have infinity only when you write on it, right? Yeah. Until you start validate. And yeah. this one will have uh, one when you start the validate, and it will see that that guy has zero, so it, it has not started the validate because uh, its timestamp is, is same as the database. Are you saying if T2 performs a write, to this object A, it'll get an it'll get a it'll modify the write timestamp of its local copy to infinity. So it is checking that, right? Yeah. So it is, since it is same as the database one, so it's getting to know that neither it has written to it and neither the validate phase has started. If the validation phase has started, then this timestamp would be like two or something else, not the one that the database. Yeah. So if it makes a write. It'll get a local time. It'll get a timestamp at validation, and it'll update the right timestamp there. If there's no conflicts. Yeah. So in our second example, um, I saw that um, after our validate phase for T two, we did not immediately write. Um, does that make a difference? If the like the write phase of um, transaction two was not immediately after the validate phase. Uh, Shouldn't it be right after you validate it? No, no, no. You have to you, you have to have, have this write be atomic. So you write all all your changes back into into the database in this phase. But then after um, we validated for T2, we let T1 write first. That, that's just because of the schedule that we have here. So we have the like the it, you can think of it as like we begin the validation, we finish, and then we do a context switch here, and now we begin the validation in the write phase. All right, so this is the second example. Um, there's still one more to go. Uh, in this one, um, the transaction, uh, you have to ensure that the transaction uh, TI completes its read phase before transaction TJ uh, begins its read phase. So you have to ensure that the write set of, the, of my transaction doesn't inter intersect with the, the read set and the write set of all these of the transactions that fall into this category where the read phases are, are overlapping. And this is um, another example of um, how we can go through this. So uh, let's see. In this scenario, T1 is reading and writing A. Oops. Uh, T2 is reading B and reading A. T1 begins, and begins its validation phase. So it gets a timestamp of 1. Um, and now I can uh, commit it because my, my write set doesn't intersect with the read set transaction T2 at this point in time. Okay? So I can install my changes back into the into the database. I, I update 456 or update A with the value 456 and I set my write timestamp to 1, which is the timestamp that that I was assigned at validation phase. Okay? Then when we come back down into uh, we do a context switch back into T2, T2 does a read of B uh, or sorry, a read of A. And now it can go back to the main, it goes to the, to the main database and does a local copy of the updated value of, uh, of A made by T1. And then it can validate and write successfully because there are no concurrent transactions.
when will we put uh, zero or infinity or one for the time scale? So if you if you let's go back to this example. Um, so when you want to perform a write, right? You make a local copy of the of the database object into your local private workspace, and then that's when you set the timestamp to infinity. You set it to infinity because you don't know what your timestamp is going to be because you haven't been assigned one yet, right? It's it's zero here, mainly for mainly for illustrative purposes. You can think about like there was at some trans, some transaction with timestamp zero that bulk loaded all of these objects into into the database. So that's why the write timestamps are zero. When you read it, you read whatever write, uh, whatever timestamp is associated with associated with the object at that point. Yeah. So T two does a read of A, does a valid does a validation, does a write. Everything is good because there's no concurrent transactions. Yeah. Yeah. These are all forward validation. Yeah. Correct. So, with, Yeah, you still need to rely on the same timestamps. Um, yeah, so that that was essentially the. I'm kind of, we've been kind of hand wavy on a couple of things on how you actually install the writes atomically and how you do the validations in a parallel way because in in a real system you have to do this parallel parallel validation. But I think hopefully the the main idea has gotten across, right? Um, it's not too complicated. There are some there's there's some trickeries here and there, but uh, generally it's it's pretty intuitive. Um, so there's a few observations that we should we should try to make. Um, all of these time step ordering and optimistic concurrency protocols sort of work well when there's very little conflict, right? Because you allow the transactions to proceed without acquiring locks, without doing anything heavy weight at work time. And at the end, you do a sort of lightweight, semi-lightweight validation to make sure that your transaction is still valid. So if you have uh, very few, um, very few conflicts, um, even better if, if, if all your transactions are essentially just doing read-only work. And if they access disjoint sets of data, then this, these protocols work very well because uh, they're actually not doing much work at all aside from doing some local data copy, right? Um, Another way to think about this is that if you have a, a very large uh, uh, workspace and very small transactions, then the probability of these transactions overlapping in the read and write sets is very low. In this specific scenario, these optimistic concurrency protocols work very well. On the other hand, in very highly contentious workloads, um, what ends up happening is that you have transactions consistently restarting, right? So they'll do a lot of work um, in, their, in their work phase, <clears throat> assuming that there is no there's, there is no contention, and, and only at the very end do they figure out, oh crap, all this work that I've done is kind of useless after we start, right? Um, so you're kind of deferring a lot of the, the heavy lifting towards the end, assuming that there won't be a lot of heavy lifting. But in the contentious workload, there is heavy lifting because you essentially have to abort everything you've done. Um, so really, I think, I think the, the, the research sort of shows that uh, in contentious workloads, um, both two-phase locking and these optimistic concurrency protocols generally don't work. They're sort of like almost equivalent. So in 2PL, you're essentially acquiring, there's, there's a lot of contention on locks. So you have transactions waiting and, and um, these hot locks. Here you have transactions that are doing all their work, almost wasteful work, and then aborting at the very end. So neither really work for contentious workloads. But if your workload is, is, has very low contention, then in general, these optimistic uh, protocols work better because they uh, they have no overhead, they have very very minimal overhead aside from some like local data copy. Okay. Whereas in the two PL uh, protocol, you actually have to acquire locks, even if there's no logical reason that uh, you should be acquiring these locks. No, so the timestamp, the timestamps are, are assigned at validation. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. Why we don't assign the timestamps at the beginning of the, this transaction? Because like the T2 begins uh, from this, like from this uh, graph, it seems like this two uh, transactions begin at the same time. But then T2 reads the value A 
after Py did Py write something? I think what you're describing is essentially basic timestamp ordering, right? So in basic timestamp ordering, you assign the timestamps when the transaction begins. Yeah. In OCC, just the protocol dictates that you assign the timestamps at validation time. Okay. Because you want to defer the work of doing the actual checking uh, to when you're ready to commit. Whereas basic timestamp ordering is saying, every operation I'm going to perform, I want to do a check to make sure that this is a valid operation. So just how the protocol works. You still need to make a local copy even if you're reading to ensure repeatable reads. <clears throat> right, so this slide is, is essentially just saying that for low contention workloads, these optimistic concurrency protocols work very well because they have very little overhead in comparison to two-phase locking, which, you know, even if you have um, disjoint working sets between between transactions, you still have to have transactions requ acquire locks. Whereas here, there's no locks at all. But here, when you are like reading the values of the other tables, like you need to, uh, like transaction one needs to check with the, trans the overlapping transaction tables, then also it has to require some sort of lock, right? Ah, this guy, yeah, you're right. So <clears throat> you don't have to acquire like a database level lock, you still have to require latches. You still have to make sure the integrity of the data structure is valid, right? You can't just blindly overwrite stuff in memory because there could be concurrent access to these, to these structures. So I think you're kind of hitting on the point that we will talk about it, um, I think, in this slide. Um, yeah, so there is a little bit of overhead in, in, in OCC, right? Because you have to maintain local copies of everything that you want to read and write. So if you're updating a billion tuples, you have to make a billion copies. Every transaction has to make a billion copies. And so there's a lot of overhead here. Um, the other thing is that the validation and the write phases, they were happening serially, right? The only one transaction can be validating at a time. In reality, you know, in real systems, you have parallel validation and parallel writing, but again, even those, in those scenarios, these phases become a big bottleneck. <coughs> and lastly, um, because we're being optimistic, we're assuming that we can perform all of the work with, you know, safely without being uh, interrupted by other, by, by other transactions. But in contentious workloads, that's not, this, that's not the case, right? That assumption is invalidated. So in contentious workloads, we're doing all this work up front, and then we could find out later that we actually have to abort. So all of this work is wasted. We're being optimistic, and we're being wrong about that optimism. <coughs> um, <clears throat> so... When a transaction commits, um, they, 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 um, I, th I think the, the student was, was, was pointing this out correctly. Um, even, if these, even if the transactions logically don't overlap with each other, you still have to make sure that you maintain the physical integrity of the data structure you're going to be looking at. So as part of the validation phase, you have to look at, oh, I have you know, all these, these other thousand tra transactions. I have to look inside the reads, read and write sets in a consistent way. I make this consistent by, um, by acquiring latches, right? So this latch overhead can actually play a big role. Um, even if they're logically dis disjoint, uh, physically they're still contending on the same data structures, right? They're still contending on the read and write data sets, even though logically they're disconnected. Yes? Why, why do you have to do that? So when I'm doing my validation, right, I have one transaction and me. I'm ready to validate. I have to go into his read and write transaction set to make sure that we don't intersect. Right, but he could be modifying it because he's still running. He or she's still running, right? So I have to acquire a latch, read a consistent view of it, perform the intersection to make sure I'm, I'm okay. And he and the, this other transaction can't modify that, that set while I'm reading it. But it's, it's actually modifying in its local copy, right? But I'm reading the local copy. I'm reading that transaction's local copy of the working set. Why, why don't you just look at the table? Because the table doesn't have all of the updates that have been applied uh, that, that this transaction has read, and, has read and written to, right? The transaction has a local copy of reads and writes. So to see if this transaction has read a value that I'm writing to, I only know that by looking at his read and write set. I don't know that by looking at the table. So I have to look at the local, the wor the local working copies for all the, uh, the, the other transactions as part of my validation. And I do that, and in order to do that in a consistent way, I have to acquire latches. And this latches, these latches can have some overhead. Yeah. Uh, 
only because like, like each transaction shall be only like accessing a small number of things. You can have like you know, hey, I'm accessing this, this, and this, and then. Yeah, there's this. Yeah, there's there's a lot of techniques that you can use to reduce the slash contention. But at the end of the day, like if you, even if you have a parallel setting, there is some overhead, right? <clears throat> um, so what if we take um, a slightly different view, right? What if we um, what if we uh, partition the entire database um, so that all of the stuff that one transaction has to work on is only within one transaction? And then I can remove all of my locks and latches altogether. Is that even possible? So it turns out that this is a, this is a valid technique, and um, it's called partition-based timestamp ordering. The idea is that I want to split up my database into these uh, horizontal partitions, right? Um, and then I want to be able to use timestamps to order the transactions on a partition in serial order. Right? So if I have transactions execu executing serially, then there's no reason, or sorry, within a database, there's no reason to have locks and latches at all because there's no concurrent activity, right? If they're operating single-threaded. I, I don't need locks, I don't need latches. Um, <clears throat> and then um, it gets a little bit complicated if you have to access multiple of these database partitions, but if you're only accessing all the data within one partition, then it, then it can be potentially really, really fast. And this is sort of what partition-based timestamp ordering is trying to achieve. So let's, let's walk through an example. So imagine that um, um, I have this, this schema uh, that represents some online store that I'm running. I have customers, orders, and the, uh, the order items, uh, the items in the order for, this, for, 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 for an order. What I could potentially do is, um, because I have these foreign key references, I can store within one partition of the, of the table a set of customers all of their orders and all of the items for their orders by using this, uh, this, this, this foreign key reference structure. Okay, so imagine that I have two databases now where I have customers 1 through 1001 and 1001 to 2000 in a, in a separate database. And I want to, I don't know, let's say I want to update a customer's name, I want to add an order to one customer's order, right? What, what do I do? Um, so a transaction, I have an application here, and it begins a transaction, and let's say that it's trying to update customer, customer one, it falls into this partition here. So, okay, it's missing something. So assume that uh, in this line, there's, a, there's an operation that says, get me the name of the customer whose ID is one. Okay, that's an operation that obviously falls into this partition because this customer belongs in this partition. All right? Um, and then it does commit. And it can safely do that, right? Because all of these transactions get queued up and operate in a single thread in this, trans in, in this database. There's no concurrent activity at all. Similarly, I can have another um, application server that wants to update the customer 1004. That'll go here. And these two transactions are totally disjoint. They're operating on different customers. And that's one way that we get parallelism, even though each database is operating single threaded. Okay, the finer grain that we can have these customers, we can store these, these database partitions, the more parallelism we can get. And that way, each, each individual transaction runs much faster because we don't have to acquire locks and latches. And we get parallelism by having more of these transactions running concurrently on disjoint sets of the data. Is that clear? All right. <clears throat> so this turns out to be a, a very uh, popular protocol. Um, you still have to assign uh, transactions an ID, and then you queue them up by, uh, uh, by, by these IDs. Um, and uh, the, the, this type of partition-based protocol uh, has been actually very, very, very successful. So Andy worked on this system called HStore, which is a commercial system um, uh, that now get, that got commercialized into VoltDB, and they're still using this, this type of partition-based timestamp ordering. Um, Andy worked with uh, someone called a professor called Dan Abadi, who's at I think Maryland now, who did some initial work on a system called Calvin that's now been commercialized in, into Fauna, that also uses something very similar to this. And there's a, a system called KDB, which is a, like a financial database, um, and they also use this technique. And it's actually pretty successful if you if your workload su supports this type of partition-based operation. <clears throat> um, the way that you can view this is that every single database essentially has a, has a giant lock or a latch around it, and uh, when a transaction is ready to commit, it acquires this latch, and it begins execution within the, uh, uh, within the database, fully single-threaded, bare metal, bare metal speed. 
And then as other transactions come up, they queue up on this latch and they essentially get assigned a timestamp. And then as their, as their timestamp gets, gets ringed up, they begin execution into this database, uh, into this, into this database partition. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's it. Um, so for, 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 for reads, um, the database, the, the transactions can essentially read whatever they want right now safely without acquiring latches because they can guarantee, the database system guarantees that there's no other transaction running in the system. Um, this is great if you only want to read stuff within, the, within one database partition. It gets complicated when you want to try to read um, uh, rows that exist across partitions. So in the, in the application server we had before, let's say that you want to mo modify within one transaction customers from two different partitions that becomes complicated because now I have to acquire the lock for one partition and acquire a lock for the other partition before I can do any sort of operation. Okay, and oftentimes it's not even possible to know a priori all of the partitions I have to touch. Right, so some systems what they actually do is they'll run the system in sort of like a like a speculative or like reconnaissance mode to figure out all of the partitions I need to access, and then uh, roll back, acquire all the locks ahead of time, and then begin execution. Right. Um, yeah. So. That's essentially what this is talking about. If I have to access cross partitions, uh, cross partition rows, I have to abort and restart and acquire the new locks, the new set of locks that I've discovered during execution. And this can be wasteful. So if you you have to be kind of careful about when you want to apply partition-based timestamp ordering. Um, so in contrast to regular timestamp ordering and, and, and OCC, I can now apply all my updates in place. Right, so in OCC and in basic timestamp ordering, I had a private workspace that, that, apply, that I have to apply my updates so that I don't conflict with other transactions that are running concurrently um, that want to read the same stuff that I'm writing. Okay, but here, because the system guarantees that there's only one transaction running at a time, I can apply my updates in place. And of course, I have some extra logic to ensure that when I abort, I undo those changes, but I can do this without making a local copy. So I've reduced the data copying overhead that would normally exist in OCC systems. Um, and, uh, and, and as in, in, the, in the read case, if I try to modify um, a tuple that exists in a different partition than what I'm running on right now, I'll abort, restart, get a lock on both database systems or database partitions, and then begin my execution. Yeah? Why do you think that it's going to be just a single thread for each partition? It can happen that uh, multiple like, if we consider that as a separate database only, uh, we still would need to have the local copy, right? No. No, because every database has only one transaction ex execution thread. Every partition has one transaction execution thread. Okay. Right? That's, that's sort of one reason why you want to do this. Because you, by having only one thread, you don't have to copy, you don't have to have a locks and latches. Yes? Won't this lead to a light lock? Like, I'm trying to... I have a lock here and trying to get a lock here and the other transaction has a lock here and he wants to get a lock here and we both of both awards then again the same thing happens and we continue doing this. Yeah, so I, I think um, there, there are ways that you can remedy this, right? You have, if, you, if you have a deterministic order that you acquire the locks, that's one way to alleviate this problem. But I think you're sort of alluding to the fact that you could have the case where you keep <coughs> learning during execution that, you have, that you're touching different partitions. So you do a bit of work, realize you, you have to acquire a, a lock for a, a partition that you don't have, abort, retry, get further in the execution, realize you have to acquire a different lock in a different partition, abort, and then restart. And this, you sort of incrementally grow the set of locks that you have to acquire uh, because you don't know a priori. Um, uh, Even if like, there are only two transactions and they want to acquire two locks, then if they are like, trying to acquire both the same lock and one requires one and the other requires the other. They can't uh, acquire the each, uh, each other's locks and they also can't do the transaction because they need to have both the locks before doing the transaction. So they both have to abort and they both will come back. Both have taken one one lock. Both have to again abort. Yeah, but you, so you solve that problem by having the, these transactions acquire the locks in a specific order, in a deterministic order. So you have, let's say you have partition A and B, um, you have T1, T2 trying to access A and B. They realize that they need different partitions. Then they restart, they abort, and now they all acquire A and they all acquire B. And then they get queued up and they get executed in that order. All right? 
All right, so that's essentially partition-based time step ordering. Um, this is sort of a visual illustration of what's going on. <coughs> and so you have two servers that are both trying to access some customer data in this first partition. Uh, they issue a begin request. They get queued up in this transaction queue. They get assigned timestamps. Assume that server one gets timestamps 100. Server two gets timestamp 101. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the, the database system will take the transaction with the lowest timestamp, in this case, the, the one from server one. It begins execution um, acquire, by acquiring a lock on this, on this database partition. It finishes its, its execution. Uh, it, it does, it, sorry, it's doing a bunch of work. It's getting the custom ID and it's updating the stuff. The animations are a little bit wonky. But then it does a commit. Um, it's safe because no, nothing else is, is running at the same time. So now this, uh, this partition can now move up this, this uh, request from server two up in the queue, uh, begin execution, acquire the lock, and then the whole cycle continues. All right. Um, <clears throat> as we've sort of talked about a little bit, these systems um, obviously are not a silver bullet, right? They have, a, they have some performance issues. So these systems are very fast if the database knows what partitions the transaction needs uh, before even beginning execution. That's not really possible in, in sort of an interactive transaction protocol, right? Um, but you can remedy this by having stored procedures, right? In stored procedures, you declare um, everything. Um, you, you don't have to do round trips back and forth. <clears throat> and the database runs everything on the server side, so it can <coughs> determine much quicker all of the, the locks the system needs before uh, or during execution. And um, if, the, if, the, if the transaction only touches one partition, then obviously it's going to be really fast. But if it has to touch multiple partitions, then you have to do some execution, abort, retry by acquiring more locks, and then continue execution again. Right? So it becomes slower. But if your transaction only touches data within one partition, then you're essentially running at bare metal speed because it's, um, it's single-threaded. Right? There's no locks, no latches. The other drawback is that. Um, if you have this multi-partition setup, you could have some, trans uh, um, so some partitions that are essentially idle because you have one hot, uh, one hot partition. OK, so that, that, that was essentially partition-based timestamp ordering. <clears throat> I try to get through this a little, as, as fast as possible. So uh, one of the assumptions that we've been making uh, throughout this work is that the, as transactions execute, they don't really um, insert new data. Uh, they only modify data and they read data. Okay, so when you now add the requirement that data can can be inserted and updated and deleted um, and inserted during execution, it violates some of the assumptions that we've been uh, that, that we've made in our protocols, and we have to handle them. Okay, um, and specifically, it introduces an interesting problem uh, that's called uh, the phantom problem. So imagine that we have the same sequence of uh, execution here, but now I'm using SQL statements instead of regular read and write operations. And we have these two transactions, T1 and T2. Um, and we have the data, this database here of people that have you know, name and age and some status. So I have transaction T1 that's performing, that's getting the maximum, the, the oldest person whose status is lit. Okay. So let's assume that it runs and it figures out that the maximum age is 72. And then we have this transaction T2 that's essentially going to insert into the same database uh, with a new person whose age is 96, who also happens to be lit, all right? And then we get back here, so it's the same T1, tries to re-execute the same query, um, and it gets a different version. It gets a different result from this query. So it got 96 here, and it got 72 here. Okay? This is clearly a problem, right? Can, can two-phase locking solve this? Assume tuple access. Uh -huh. Who said no? Why do you say no? Because you will have locks on the tuples that you are reading, right? If a new tuple comes, then you won't have a lock on that. Yeah, exactly. That's, a, that's exactly right, right? Um, you can only access locks on, on, on tuples that, 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 that exist. Um, <clears throat> so because, of, because there was a new transaction that inserted a new tuple, they, I didn't even have something to acquire a lock on. Right? And that's clearly a problem. And how do we solve this? If I want to ensure serializability, I have to ensure that I can ensure, I can ensure re repeatable reads. So I have to solve this phantom problem. Okay, so what if 
um, instead of acquiring locks on tuples, I can acquire locks on abstract objects. What if I can acquire a lock on an expression status lit? Would that solve the problem? If I had a lock on all tuples that satisfy the condition, status is equal to lit. Who says yes? One person. Who says no? Who says they don't know? Okay, so the answer is yes. If you could have a powerful, a powerful enough locking system that you can have an a lock on an expression that says status is equal, is equal to lit, you can solve this problem. That would solve it for you. Right? But the problem, and the, the, the term that we're talking about here is, is called predicate locking, is, is that it's very, very expensive to be able to do this. And in fact, I don't think any systems actually do that type of really complex logic because it's very complex. Right? I gave you one example of status is equal to lit, but what we're actually talking about is a multidimensional problem because you could have any arbitrary complex expression and you want to ensure that the, the expression you're evaluating doesn't intersect with this multidimensional space. So it's non-trivial to implement. So most systems don't do that. Yes? What's the hierarchical locking scheme solved in the last lecture solved this problem? Yeah, so you could acquire a, like a table level lock or a page level lock. No, but like you have a shared lock on the table and like this guy who has to insert will have to have an exclusive lock on the table. So that will solve it, right? Yeah, so you could use these uh, hierarchical locks. That's one way to definitely solve it. The other way to solve it is this, this predicate locking that I was talking about, which is more general purpose. Um, and there's another one called index locking. So if I have an index on the system, right? let's say I have an index on the, on the status attribute, what I could do is take a lock on the slot in the index where status is equal to lit, so that any new insertions have to go through the index and make an update, they can't acquire that lock. Okay, so that's another way to solve it. If the status lit doesn't even exist in the index, what I have to do is acquire what's called a gap lock. So a gap in the index, I acquire a lock on that gap. So that if another insertion comes in that tries to insert status is equal to lit in that space in the index, it's not allowed to do that. Okay? So these, that's, that's two, essentially two ways um, to do it. Um, yeah, so this essentially goes back to the point that was made earlier. If you don't have an index and you don't have predicate locks, um, you could do it by locking every, every page or you could do it by uh, locking the entire table or, um, yeah, hierarchical locks. So I... And sorry, the last way to, to solve this problem is through just by repeating the scans by, by the committing, uh, but, sorry, before committing. So I think one of the most popular systems that does this is, is, is Hecaton, which is from Microsoft. So essentially, every, before you commit, you have to make sure that everything you read um, before happens just before you commit to, to make sure you have consistent reads. I think we're out of time. Uh, the last section was weaker isolation levels. Maybe we'll cover that in the next lecture. All right? All right. That's it. Oh dear, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Nas poo. In the midst of broken bottles and crushed up can. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry It's with St. Nas in my system. Crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the wild, I'll be stressed out. Could never be sun. Rick is a jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes. My rap is like a laser beam. The pawns in the bushes. St. Nas. Crack the bottle of the St. I, sip it through those who don't realize that drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive, keep my people alive, and if the saint don't know you from a can of paint, paint.